know, that's a commitment of the National Urban League. I look forward to doing that work together. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary John King, one more time, an Urban League round of applause. Thank you for your work and for your insight. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now prepared uh, for what's going to be a great discussion. Uh, we want to certainly thank uh, the Walton Family Foundation uh, for its support. And I'm proud to turn this program over to Lynn Jennings. Lynn is a native of Baltimore, a graduate of Spelman, a former college professor, and the field director for the Education Trust. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Jennings. Good afternoon, everyone. So I thought, I know we're short on time, but I thought it would be helpful if I gave some context for this panel discussion um, before we bring out our panelists, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we'll um, cover t this afternoon. Um, I want to start this off with telling a brief history about a school, Elmont High School. It's a high achieving high school right outside of New York City. Its student body is primarily African American with some Hispanic and Asian students. For well over a decade, Elmont has had a graduation rates ranging from 92% to 98%. That's compared to the national graduation rate for black students of 73%. Almost all the graduates earn what is called in New York a Regents Diploma, which is the standard academic diploma, and almost half earn an advanced designation. The AP participation at Elmont is 42%, and nearly every graduate in the class of 2015 went on to college. The media loves reporting about this school. Year after year, they report on the valedictorian or even the salutatorian who was accepted into all eight Ivies. They do this so much so that every year they go there to look for the magical student. But I'm here to tell you that there's no magic happening at Elmont. This school has solid leadership, hardworking teachers who work together, high expectations for each student, each student, and the students say that what they really get there is real peer pressure, the peer pressure to succeed academically. This is the kind of school that I want for my boys who are one and three years old, and the kind of schools that we want in all of our communities. But the reality is that too many of our children go to, don't go to Elmont. Instead, they go to schools of less of everything, less funding, less resources, less access to AP and IB courses, less rigor in their assignments, and less qualified teachers. And we know that this is happening because the systems are set up this way. And then what happens? The very system that fails these children, we, turn, we start blaming the children, or we say they have lower academic achievement because of them, the students, their parents, their communities, their culture, anything but the systems that are constantly um, underserving them. And I just want to end this with talking, we talked to some of the students about this. And the children, the students know that this injustice is happening in their educations, educational experience and happening in their schools. Consider this quote from an African American 11th grader in AP English. We were going to be taking the same exact AP, te AP test as the students we met from the other school. We needed to know the exact same things, but while they were starting to read the Odyssey, we were reading the Hunger Games. There was nothing wrong with the Hunger Games. In fact, I love the Hunger Games. I read it when I was 12. But it struck me as really, really unfair that I was asked to do the same thing on the same, same AP test and I was getting something so different. So this, again, is the context for today's panel. We're going to talk about what needs to happen and what we can do as we continue our march towards educational justice for all of our children. And so with that, let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Steve Perry. Dr. Steve Perry, who is the principal of Capital Preparatory Magnet School. Dr. Perry is an education contributor for CNN and MSNBC, an Essence Magazine columnist, best-selling author, and host of the number one docu docudrama for TV One, Save My Son. Next, Dr. Perry. 
Next, we have Ms. Johanna Hayes, who is the 2016 Teacher of the Year. <clears throat> she is a spokesperson for the teaching profession. She has taught for the past 12 years, 10 years of which she has been in her current role as a history teacher at John F. Kennedy High School in Waterbury, Connecticut. Next, we have Dr. Julian Vasquez Heilig. I hope I got that right. He is a professor of educational leadership and policy studies and the director of the doctorate in educational leadership at California State Sacramento. He has a blog, Cloaking Inequity, and serves as the California NAACP Education Chair. Chair. And finally, but not least, we have Ms. Erica McConduit. She is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater New Orleans. She is heavily involved in New Orleans in the state of Louisiana's overall education reform, and she particularly serves as a representative of community engagement arm of that movement. So here is our panelists. Thank you. So I thought what we would start with today is the issue that's been on, I've seen a lot in the news and on a lot of folks' mind, and that's school choice and charter schools. Um, we know in the African American community that there are multiple views on, on charter schools and school choice. But with the recent resolution that the NAACP is considering on the moratorium on charter schools, I'd like to hear you talk about and think about what are some of the challenges of charter schools, the opportunities, and um, what we need to do moving forward. Uh, is this on? Thank you. Um, you know, for the Urban League, we really, our position is really focused on quality, um, high quality educational options. It's not about charter, direct run, homeschool. Honestly, our position is making sure that all students have access to a high quality education. And so it is, I don't think that, you know, we should choose. We should present options to families um, and allow them to make the choice in terms of what's the best fit in terms of education for their child. Dr. Perry, I don't know. Uh, the recent move by the NAACP is an abomination. It undermines what the parents themselves are asking for. Millions of parents have in fact voted with their feet. They've said that they don't want to be in the failed schools of their district. The same impetus that brought forward the Brown versus Board of Education decision some almost 60 years ago. The fact remains that we as parents, many of us who are middle class, exercise school choice every single year and it wasn't until poor people and most specifically black and latina mothers started to decide where they were going to send their children to school that school choice actually became an issue it is otherwise seen as a basic tenet of parenting a parent should send their child to the very best school for them the issue is not charter or traditional private or public it's the teachers union has embedded themselves so deeply into the conversation that it's no longer even about children. It's about working conditions. And until such time as we start to call balls and strikes and say it for what it is, then we're going to skirt around the issue. And in the meantime, those of us who are actually on the ground doing this will watch children die a, a, a death, death by a million cuts. Okay. Julian? Well, you know, I think the idea that the NAACP is out of touch, 2,200 people voted on this resolution. The NAACP has been a vanguard of civil rights for decades. Um, and I, I think you have to go back at the, to the 2010 and the 2014 resolutions to understand the context of this. The 2014 NAACP resolution talked about the privatization and private control of schools. And that's actually really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about civil rights or access to schools, I think where Dr. Perry and I can agree is that, as you talked about in your intro, that uh, African-American, Latino, and other poor folks are getting uh, short end of the stick when it comes to resources in their schools. But 
what the education reformers have put on the table is top-down private control and privatization of schools. Choice does not have to be that way. Choice can be about community-based solutions that are democratically controlled, such as community schools uh, and other uh, community-based charters that are uh, intra-district. And so what the NAACP said is that we need to take stock. We need to take stock of what's happening with school choice. And the ACLU in California came out with a report on Monday that said that more than 20% of schools, charter schools in California, have illegal practices. And what those practices boil down to is that the schools are choosing the students instead of the students choosing the schools. Okay, so one thing that's come up, I mean, I hear you both talking about the teachers and community, and so I really want, we have a teacher up here, you know, um, and I want all of, I think about often we have um, these policy conversations and how we're going to address inequities and how we're going to fix inequities in school. And one group we often hear that feels like they're out, they're outside of these conversations, not at the table, are the educators, the principals and the teachers who are doing this work every day. And so I'm just curious, John, how do you see, um, how do we make sure that educators like you are part of these conversations? Well, before I even answer that question, just really quickly about the charter school question, I am a huge proponent of public education. I'm a public school teacher, a product of the public schools. I believe in it. However, I'm also a parent, and when it we have to fix public education because when it comes to my child, I have one shot at this. And fortunate for me and my husband, we have options where if the school in my district is not working, we can move. But so many people, my parents didn't have options. So I had to trust that the public school that I was sent to was gonna provide me with the best education. And until we can answer that question for every kid, we have to do better. So it, it, it's not, it's a very complex, because as a teacher, I feel one way, but as a parent, when I look at my child every day, I have to trust that I'm doing what's best for them. Okay, so for the question you just asked as a teacher, I think that, I know from my own perspective, when I came into this role, many teachers don't see themselves as being a part of this conversation. It's very intim intimidating. You know, you think you have to understand policy and you have to have done the research. And most of our experiences in the classroom on the ground level. What I found in my role as the National Teacher of the Year is, at the table, I am the teacher. So it's okay not to understand all the policy conversations that is going on. What I can do is share my perspective with the people at the table, with the legislators, with the policymakers, and help them to understand how the decisions they make affect me in the classroom. And I think teachers have not been allowed to take those kind of risks at the local level, so oftentimes they don't speak up, or they think they're underqualified or unqualified to engage in these discussions. So I think just at the very basic local level, we have to start some participatory decision making. We have to allow teachers to take risks, to join the conversation, to exercise their voice so that they understand that if they say something that is not working, it's not going to be seen as punitive at the district level. And so, I mean, you, you said as a, as a teacher, coming as a teacher, and so I'm curious, um, Eric, you talk about just we talk a lot about community engagement and making sure that community members, parents, are also engaged in these conversations. Because I can say from my own experience, I work in an education policy world, but as a parent of two boys in Washington, D.C., it's a whole nother ball game. And even I feel like, how do I enter these conversations? So I'm curious what kind of work you're doing and um, how do we make sure that community members and parents and everybody are part of these conversations? Absolutely. And, I, and I'll say, even for those of us who work in this every day, it's confusing, right? Right? And so we have to always remember that, you know, parents are even um, at a greater distance from those of us who have the privilege of working in this on a daily basis. I have three kids myself and following all the different changes in terms of policy from the local level to the state level. And now you're telling me we have a new federal, you know, ESSA that, to introduce into the mix. And so for us at the Urban League, we really um, make sure that to the extent that we could educate parents, community members, about the opportunity that the new legislation provides for them to, to deeply engage, for them to be a part of the conversation to say, you know, how should our schools be measured and held accountable? ESSA provides the opportunity to build um, a new accountability system to decide how states will intervene and when. And I think that's critically important for parents and community members to understand. So we work consistently to make sure that we are bringing the information directly to them in a way that they can understand. And then the, the flip side of that is then taking that back up to, you know, our state superintendent, John White, who has been incredibly um, 
really good about partnering with community-based organizations and, and more specifically civil rights organizations. And I have to say that because this is a civil rights law and we need to continue to say that over and over again. ESSA is a civil rights law, which means that the opportunity that's presented in, in it also comes with great responsibility. And states have not always been the best stewards necessarily of ensuring and protecting civil rights. So it is critically important that civil rights organizations like the Urban League and all the other civil rights, the NAACP and, and so many others are continuing to work directly with community and parents and bring that information um, back to the forefront to ensure that rights um, are, are, and, and concerns are being part of the conversation in how we build our systems moving forward. And so I, I heard you mention that definitely with ESSA, we talk about the risk and the opportunities and accountability, accountability systems. One thing that happened, we know, in the No Child Left Behind is that there was this feeling of um, it became a gotcha system, you know? And I see, I see you, Steve, shaping, shaking your head because I think some people would very much disagree. But I want to say we have some lessons from the last 15 years or so. So if you can give me one lesson learned, but also particularly looking, how do we move forward? What, what do we do where we balance? definitely accountability, but also we're making sure that we're strengthening and improving our schools and so we can all move forward together. As Ms. Hayes will tell you, whether it's a teacher, a principal, or any school leader or educator, those of us who are doing our job want people to come in and see what we do. We're not afraid of accountability. This accountability conversation became an issue when it became a political problem for those individuals who may lose their job in the event the students' test scores were tied to their performance. The fact is that No Child Left Behind made, brought forward a very simple decree that every single child in the United States of America should be given access to the same education. I don't even know why that's revolutionary. It seems to me to be a basic human expectation in these United States. So didn't become a problem until individuals began to think that they might lose their job or the funding to schools that paid them or paid dues into organizations. We have to recognize that parents, we step away from this as a political conversation and come into it as a parent. Just like we want to know whether or not those restaurants have an A, B, C, or D on them when we go into them, we want to know how our children's schools are doing because this is it. This is our only shot at getting our children an education, and very few in this country have the capacity to buy their way out of a failed school system. And so from an accountability perspective, there are multiple opportunities that we can use. One, there's a grading system that they have in states such as Florida and New York that show how students are performing in class because that's what people want to know. That's what parents want to know. That's not what theorists want to know, but that's what parents want to know. And we as educators, as, as a high school principal for the past 10 years, actually not high school, K-12 to principal for the past 10 years, I want to know who is doing what in what classroom so that I can look a parent in the face and say, I'm giving your child access to a world-class education. At the end of the day, we have to start asking people who've actually done it effectively how they did it, as opposed to asking people who are opponents of decisions how not to do it. So I just... Oh. Oh. The teacher should speak first to all these. Well, I'll be quick. I just want to say, just to be clear, whenever accountability comes up, even good teachers don't want bad teachers in their schools. So this idea that it all looks one way or feels one way, I think that we have to be bold enough to have those conversations where we either support people and help them improve their practices. But this idea of moving teachers along, it breaks my heart when a kid tells me they had a bad experience in another class because that's not what education should look like. It should not depend upon the teacher that you have. So the idea that somehow unions were opposed to NCLB because of value-added models is silly because value-added models weren't in NCLB. They didn't come along to race to the top. So I think that, that, just, that premise doesn't work at all. So I think it should also be said that I work for the Houston Independent School District. I worked for Rod Page before he became secretary. I was in the research and accountability department. I knew the Houston Independent School District was lying to the public, saying we had 0% dropout rates and that we'd close the achievement gap. And that's why by 2014, it never happened in the United States. What NCOB actually did is it privatized assessment. It turned assessment over to large corporations such as Pearson because we no longer wanted educators to do the assessment. 
That's what No Child Left Behind did, and I think that's where the pushback has come from parents and communities, is because they don't believe the assessment is valid or reliable. And any statistician will tell you that the tests that are being used for value-added models, and I took eight statistics courses at Stanford, so this is something I really like to talk about, is not, they're, they're not reliable for those models. And that, that's, I think that's important. One final thing is that in California, we're doing what's called local accountability where we need the NAACP, we need the Urban League, we need LULAC to be involved because what happens in California is now the accountability plans are designed at the local level. And the state also provided additional monies from Prop 30 so that there's now a carrot with the stick. And those plans are focused specifically on, excuse me, on at-risk kids, on ELL kids, and on uh, foster youth. And those plans have to show short-term and long-term plans. So accountability can happen. It doesn't have to be top-down, Texas style, like No Child Left Behind was. It can actually involve communities and involve equity resources targeted on the communities that matter to us. Okay, I'm looking at my time because we don't have much time. But what, what I'm hearing, I mean, we, I, I started off with NCLB, which is always a hot button issue, right? You know. But I think we're all saying that there isn't a problem with accountability. Like we all can believe that accountability is important. But I, I really want to push on. We got that behind us. We're moving forward. States are about to do their plans. They're about to implement plans. If we've been marching on this on thinking about inequities for a very long time in education, we know there's no one solution to fix them all. But if you could think of two that you could just snap your finger and it could happen, what would it be? How would, how would, how would we address some of the inequities? <laughs> That's a big one. I would say number one would be ensuring access um, to disadvantaged populations and, and, and subgroups that we often look at. I would say we don't have access to uh, black and brown kids aren't having access to gifted and talented programs as much as others, to AP courses as much as others, to experienced teachers as much as their, their counterparts, to um, high performing schools. I mean, you can go down the list in terms of all the things that you know will make a successful um, high performing school and our kids um, have less access to them. So I would say number one, ensure access to the things that we know work and then maintain high standards, college and career ready standards and strong accountability. I would say that we have to include communities and we can't look at education as only what happens inside of a school building. It has to be, if kids aren't moving forward academically and social, socially, you know, I can't teach a kid who's had a toothache for seven months and doesn't have health insurance to address it. You know, until we look at these things as interconnected and say, as we raise their socioeconomic status and their uh, um, access to opportunities, then by default, I, their education will be raised. And also, I think not lowering the standard. You know, I think there's this idea that certain schools will master certain content and other schools just need a basic education. I want the same education. I want the same access to opportunities. And we look at it through this lens of, if you don't like it at this school, you can go somewhere else. That's not an option for everyone. I want my kids to know that when they leave, they can compete or at least know that they have the same level of understanding as any kid in any school, in any state, in any zip code. Julia? So I, I think, uh... I've talked about a few of those, but we really need to focus on community-based reform. The last decade has been all about top-down reform that's privately controlled by just a few people. So community schools is one way we deal with these two things, which is that we provide the resources to do the wraparound services, the health services that we can, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the kids aren't going to be ready to do Common Core if they have two things, right? And so uh, also community-based assessment of students. The New York Performance Coalition does this. Uh, wealthy districts use these portfolio approaches. Is we're, no one's saying that we shouldn't do assessment. We're talking about how do you do more constructivist assessment. Also, uh, community-based approaches to accountability and community-based approaches to teachers. We can think about how we can have expert consultant teachers doing the evaluating to help school leaders do that evaluating. So there's a whole set of community-based approaches, and that requires the Urban League, that requires the NAACP to be involved with those conversations. These are democratic approaches to education reform. Introduce facts into the conversation. Stop throwing around buzzwords like privatization. The Urban League is private. Churches are private. Let's have an honest conversation with those individuals who actually have run and or teach in effective schools. And, and do so with a full-on universal school choice model. That way, there is no better method of having the community involved than letting the community make their own decisions as to where they send their children. 
You should not be forced into failure because you cannot afford to move to another community. A parent is the person most likely and most effectively who can most effectively determine which school is best for her or his or their children. And so why are we having these esoteric conversations about community when the biggest part of the community is the parent? They are the end product user. Brother? Let me tell you what's esoteric. Okay, you that a universal that. school choice will work. All you have to do is go to YouTube, type in Chile YouTube school choice and social protests. And what you will see is what the U.S. media hasn't shown you is that Chile has had universal school choice for 20 years and it's accentuated the segregation. There's study after study of we have school study choice that here. shows that universal okay. school choice accentuates segregation. So we're going to um, move this to, um, the, we're going to involve y'all now out there in the audience for, um, for a, a Q and A, um, but before we do, I guess we get a thirty second, thirty second wrap up for each of you. Thirty seconds, y'all. Thirty seconds. You know, wrap up, and then we're gonna involve the audience. We can keep it simple. The community is us. The community is not a university. The community is not a think tank. The community is us as parents. We determine what's best for our children. We don't need somebody to tell us that if we're born into or live in a particular community that we can only send our child to that school unless, of course, we can win a lottery or make some money to send our child to another school. School choice is a, is a right. It's a right that we all should have and something we must fight for. It is something that we somehow have access to as middle class individuals. Why not extend that down to those people who are poor? I think I would say as a classroom teacher, I'm learning, actually in this role, I'm learning that we all have to work together. You know, I have, I had a very limited perspective of what education looked like. I know what it looked like from my classroom, but as I travel and I talk to policymakers and I sit on panels like this, I recognize that there are so many people who are equally as passionate as me who just come from a very different place. And until we can sit down and work together and figure out all of our strengths and all of our talents in the way that they can best help improve outcomes for kids, as opposed to thinking that any one way or another way is better, we're not gonna make any progress. So I think we, we have to rethink what school choice means. Does it mean that we only choose from private control, where Steve Perry creates a chartered management organization, et cetera, uh, and he decides how public dollars are spent? I think that's a, a question we have to ask ourselves, but if you ask, if you look at the polling of what parents want to choose in their schools, in their districts, they want less testing, they want pre-K, they want higher quality teachers, they want less poverty and hunger. Those are the tops of their list. And the reason why parents want and we're talking about school choice is because those things haven't been provided in their neighborhood public schools. And that's on purpose. The Texas Supreme Court ruled just a few weeks ago that it was okay to have $25,000 in difference between rich and poor schools. At the school level, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. At the district level, that's millions of dollars. And what that money buys is smaller class size. It buys pre-K for kids, it, it, all sorts of other things that are important to parents. And so, of course, parents are angry. They're rightfully angry because the system has provided them less than equal schools in their community. I would say that um, I think we need to get away from the divisive language of this versus that and what is better. I think, honestly, if we refocus the conversation on high quality and what parents want to see in the schools, the choices that they would like to make for their child's future, the, the access to programs that would advance um, educational outcomes for their kids, I think that's the conversation that we should be having versus getting caught up in the minutia of like this versus that in terms of you know what's better or worse, and really instead double down on what's gonna move our our communities forward and make sure that children and their futures are at the center of the conversation. But I think we have to take it one step further because what about the kids who don't have parents? That, absolutely. We have to do absolutely. what we know is right and not wait for parents yep. to direct us to what to do. There are so many kids who show up in my classroom every day who are either in the system or living with a family yep. member and don't have someone at home to advocate on their behalf. Absolutely. So I have to do that. Yeah. And making sure yeah, that you have the support yeah. to do that. Absolutely. All right. No, it's fine. It's fine. I think on that note, we're going to um, definitely thank the panel. Yeah. We had to really shorten this, but thank you. Thank you.